Our next speaker is the chair of the UN Global Compact Network UK, and um, she's also the head of corporate responsibility at, at Relics Group. And she's the head of corporate responsibility and data and analytics company Relics Group. Marcia Baliciano has previously spoken passionately about the extent to which corporate responsibility has moved up the agenda of not only companies, but employees, governments, and investors. And she's joining us today to talk about how the corporate sector can achieve a 1.5 degree trajectory. Please welcome Marcia. Good morning from London, and thank you so much for this opportunity. So indeed, I'd like to talk about the corporate sector's role in a one and a half degree world, and an, also a net zero future. And there's three things I'd like to discuss today, the trajectory that we're on, the challenges that we face, and the reasons for optimism. So let's start with the trajectory. 15 years ago, business began calculating its environmental impact in earnest in alignment with the greenhouse gas protocol. 10 years ago, more and more companies began putting that data into the public domain and reporting it through initiatives like CDP, working with organizations like the Carbon Trust. Five years ago, an increasing number of businesses set public targets. Assisting them along the way has been the United Nations Global Compact, which this year celebrates its 20th anniversary, alongside the 75th anniversary of the United Nations. The United Nations Global Compact is, at the moment, 11,593 companies across 156 countries committed to 10 principles encompassing human rights, labor, environment, and anti-corruption. So looking at the three principles of the Global Compact on Environment, we have principle seven, businesses should undertake initiatives to promote greater environmental responsibility. Principle eight, businesses should undertake initiatives to promote greater environmental responsibility. Principle nine, businesses should encourage the development and diffusion of environmentally friendly technologies. So I have the honor of chairing the UN Global Compact UK network, local networks like ours, which has over 200 members, are clusters of UNGC participants and signatories who come together to advance the UNGC and its principles within a particular location. Our mission is to mobilize a global movement of sustainable companies and stakeholders to create the world that we want. Online series of the UK network include uh, Making Global Goals Local Business, uh, Black Lives Matter and Business, and Climate Action Q&A Surgeries. So in this year, which also marks the five-year anniversary of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, we remember that SDG 17 partnerships to achieve the goals includes SDG 13 climate action, business has a critical role to play alongside and in conjunction with all other actors in realizing a net zero future. So on to the challenges. We are simply not doing enough to arrest climate change, evident in so many ways, extreme weather events, uncontrolled wildfires, the melting of polar ice, the loss of biodiversity and habitat with consequent stress on wildlife, which increases the risk of zoonotic transmission of diseases, in, of which COVID-19 is indicative. The Plant Conservation Report 2020, an initiative of the Convention on Biological Diversity, released last month, had a stark warning. Humanity is at a crossroads. 
The report calls for a shift away from business as usual across a range of human activities. It outlines eight transitions that recognize the value of biodiversity, the need to restore the ecosystems on which all human activity depends, and the urgency of reducing the negative impacts of human activity. World Wildlife Fund's Living Planet Report, also released in September, documents the precipitous fall in monitored populations of mammals, birds, amphibians, reptiles, and fish between 1970 and 2016. The German research vessel Polarstern docks Monday after a uh, stunning ex uh, expedition to the Arctic Ocean, exploring the state of the Arctic climate. Exhibition leader Professor Marcus Rex, as reported in the BBC, says, the sea ice is dying. And just this morning, a BBC top story reveals that the Great Barrier Reef has lost half of its coral since 1995. The report states that last year, the Australian government's official agency on the reef confirmed that human-driven warming remained the biggest threat to the reef's long-term survival. So I want to talk about a different kind of challenge as well. Um, I'm the founding global head of corporate responsibility for Relex. We are 33,000 people in 40 countries around the world, and we focus on our unique contributions to society. We're about information, data, analytics, and events like World Future Energy Summit. We are focused on those unique uh, contributions, which include universal sustainable access to information, advancing science and health at Elsevier, protecting society, including fighting fraud at LexisNexis Risk Solutions Group. And we're about furthering the rule of law and access to justice um, by helping catalog the world's laws, helping lawyers and judges to make better decisions at LexisNexis Legal and Professional, and fostering communities through read exhibitions, uh, which has over 500 shows over a two-year period, bringing buyers and sellers together and improving the efficiency of markets. To coincide with the five-year anniversary of the SDGs, we released a free report which lives on the free Relex SDG Resource Center with over 10,000 uh, sources of content and tools from across our company and key partners like the UN Environment Program and the UN Global Compact. And that report was the power of data to advance the SDGs. So we were looking at how far has knowledge progressed to support the SDGs between 2015, when the SDGs were launched, and 2019. And here's something that we found. The United States produces the most research supporting SDG 13 climate action, followed by China, the United Kingdom, Germany, and Australia. Eight of the 10 most prolific locations are high income countries, accounting for more than 139,000 publications over that period. One is an upper middle income location, China, and one is a lower middle income location, India. Yet, no low income locations featured in the top 50. High income locations collaborated with low income locations on only 2% of their total SDG 13 research, while nearly 55% of the related output from low income locations came from collaboration with high income locations. So what does that mean? It means that we need to support the research needs of low income countries, uh, those who are most affected by the issues that SDG 13 presents. Um, SDG 13 climate action affects all countries, but we need to help the world's poorest and particularly support indigenous research. So today we're in the midst of a global pandemic, COVID-19, as we've heard with its terrible human toll and devastating effect on the economic well-being of citizens everywhere. The challenge is not new. Our Elsevier Journal, Environment International, reported in 2018 the work of several scientists who stated, 
the long-term global health of populations depends on the continued sustainability and functioning of the Earth's complex ecological and physical systems that underpin the distribution of resources on which all life depends. The World Health Organization notes that while there is no evidence of a direct connection between climate change and the emergence of transmission of COVID-19 disease, climate change may indirectly affect the COVID-19 response as it undermines the environmental determinants of health. So what is there to be optimistic about? Well, we show in the power of data that research supporting SDG 13 has grown since 2015 with a compound annual growth rate of 6.3%, double the over 3% increase for research in all other fields of the SDGs. So there is a strong discussion now around the world on building back better in pro-climate ways with a need to revitalize businesses in economies around the world using innovative approaches, as we have just heard by the previous speaker, and renewable resources that don't return us to an unsustainable old normal. There is climate activism and the voices of young people campaigning against climate change have reached the global corridors of power. And there is help. As of this morning, 1,009 companies have committed to the UN Global Compact's business ambition for one and a half degrees, setting a science-based target in line with a one and a half degree future. The initiative supports business in aligning carbon targets with the science-based targets initiative to do their part to meet the Paris Agreement, acting alongside states for a world indeed low one and a half degrees by 2050. Earlier this year, 155 companies with a combined market cap of over US 2.4 trillion and representing over 5 million employees signed a UN supported statement urging governments around the world to align their COVID-19 economic aid and recovery efforts with climate science. Business ambition for one and a half degrees sends a clear signal to all stakeholders to increase their climate ambition. Reversing climate change is no longer the interest of the few. It is the imperative of the many. Business joins government, investors, employees, customers, scientists, and other members of the academy, youth, NGOs, and civil society representatives, among others, in recognizing that redressing climate change is humankind's greatest challenge. We need to capitalize on the collective will in, to build back better, to harness cultural trends wrought by the pandemic, like deploying technology to connect more of us more frequently from farther afield as we're doing today. In 2019, the UK became the first major economy to pass net zero emissions laws requiring the UK to bring all greenhouse gas emissions to net zero by 2050. And just last month, during the UN General Assembly, China announced its aspiration for an emissions peak before 2030, achieving carbon neutrality before 2060. So says the European Union, its European Green Deal is its new growth strategy. It will help us, quote, cut emissions while creating jobs. We propose a green and inclusive transition to help people's well-being and to secure a healthy planet for generations to come. As recently reported in the Financial Times, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom is, quote, drawing up a package of green energy policies to help the UK meet its ambitious climate targets, including hydrogen, fuel, carbon capture and storage, more wind farms, and bringing forward a ban on new petrol cars. New multi-billion pound initiatives are due to be released by the end of October, just as the jobs furlough scheme here in the United Kingdom comes to an end.
It is a long-term economic plan beyond the coronavirus pandemic. So the former perceived trade-off between a net zero economy and economic growth has been debunked. Addressing climate change is the economic answer. The rise of ESG, environmental, social, and governance criteria in assessing and valuing the true performance and future potential of business by investors and other stakeholders bodes well for a net zero future. The E of ESG has primacy alongside the S and the G. The Task Force for Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, TCFD, focuses corporate and investor attention on environmental performance. Investors and analysts, among others, can see that a sustainable business, one that will be there for the long haul, is one that understands and minimizes its environmental risks and capitalizes on its environmental opportunities. In summary, the call for net zero will only grow louder. Climate, importantly, is mainstream. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marcia. We actually, we have some questions if you feel, if you'd like to stay here, because I think everyone can hear you on the microphone. Um, so one of the questions is, given the opening comments about accelerating change through exchanging lessons learned more effectively, do you think there is a role for more global collaboration between professional institutions and similar organizations? In short, yes, absolutely. I think that the more that we can collaborate, the more we work together, that we share data, that we share ideas, the more accelerated progress will be. So I think the United Nations Global Compact, uh, the Carbon Trust, other players, we, we all have a role to work together. Uh, this is not um, a competitive issue, it, it's one for humanity. Okay, thank you. Another question. Renewable energy plus the end user commitment to buy plus infrastructure <clears throat> results in a greener future. The question is, can our grids keep up with the pace of change in terms of the ability to manage the new mix of generation? And can we learn from each other on this to avoid duplication? Uh, well, I'm not an expert, but uh, and there will be others speaking today who are, but I think that the grid can, it absolutely can. And if you look at um, the focus on uh, fuel cell technology and the fact that um, uh, Elon Musk's company um, and the creation of electronic vehicles has become the largest car maker in the United States. Um, so it's it's not only about the uh, outcroppings of the innovation, but it's the what's lying behind it and alternatives to fossil fuels. So I think that absolutely the scale of the transition that we've seen, as I tried to allude to in the beginning of my remarks, um, has been really quite spectacular. If you think of where we were just 15 years ago. But again, the challenge is great and we need to accelerate that. So I do think that the grid can cope. And I really hope that with all of the brilliant minds uh, working around the world that we'll see this uh, happen even more quickly in the five years yet to come. And just on that, you know, a lot of people have talked about this decade being so crucial. Do you think we're going to see the changes that we need to see happen in the next 10 years? Um, well, I, I certainly hope so. And I think the global pandemic has focused minds. Um, it's allowed a kind of uh, global reset. Um, it's shown us that there's a different way of working. Um, you know, anecdotally, I was talking to a colleague of mine in India. Um, she was sitting in her garden in Delhi. She told me it was the first time that she could see a blue sky in, in as long as she could remember. Um, so that um, ability to uh, see change that has been wrought in just a small amount of time, and indeed we don't, uh, we should not squander 
the this reset that we have had we, we should use it to accelerate but um you know the we, we're behind we were already behind on the financing for the sdgs before the pandemic it's only 10 years it will be here before we know it there's so much to be done we just have to push farther and and faster. Um, I think it requires us to uh, advocate to our governments around the world uh, to use the in, uh, international institutions that we have within the UN system to really push for this this change and to bring citizens along with us so that they can see that uh, fighting climate change is is not a fringe activity, but it's something that affects their livelihood and also their their health as well. Thank you so much. Marcia Beliciano, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you.